Thank you, Remy. Uh, and thanks everybody for sticking around uh, for the bitter end here. Uh, this is where I try to warm everybody up uh, on the topic that is uh, near and dear to me, which is uh, how we treat this topic currently in the code and uh, what I think is wrong with that and what we might do to, uh, to remedy it. So first I've got to make the case that there's a problem. Uh, some of the things I think that you've heard from the three speakers ahead of me is that, uh, or one message you might take from that is that there are a lot of investigations going on right now to better understand concrete fracture phenomenon associated with load introductions like this. And I hesitate to use the terms concrete breakout. People associate those with a certain class of problem. But of course, in the end, that's what these things are. And uh, what I would like to argue for is that we uh, open our vision a little bit so that designers that use the code aren't stuck in little boxes trying to figure out which box gives them a better answer, which is sort of what's happening right now. So that's the provocative title. Um, and I open with this statement uh, because I've experienced it a lot. Uh, you're talking to somebody about anchor provisions in the code and they say, I don't use that. I use development length. It's, it's allowed by the code and gives me a much better answer. And of course, if it's in the code and it gives me a much better answer, it must be right. Huh? So uh, if you look at the uh, current provisions for headed bars, I think that they're getting shorter uh, headed bars. If you look at the equation we had in 318.14, the exponent, or excuse me, the, the constant in the equation was uh, 0 0.016, which is, if you flip it over, that's 62.5. That number is now 75, so LDT got less. There is a 1.5 exponent now on the diameter term, but for bar diameters less than an inch. It's, anyway, it, if you work it out, I, maybe you'll get a different result than I did, but it looked to me like, uh, like headed bars are getting shorter. Um, and so, I have posed this question before. I, Jeff and I gave a seminar to the Structural Engineers Association here in California, and I'm just gonna use the same little example. Uh, some people find this ridiculous because they say we don't do these things, but I know that we do. Um, I've seen it. And so if you weld headed bars to a plate, uh, conceivably, you could use development length to design this connection uh, there's nothing in the code particularly that prohibits you from doing that. Uh, and if I look at uh, these as being number eight bars in uh, 8KSI concrete, I'm going to come up with a development length that's about a foot. Uh, and if I calculate the uh, capacity of that connection in tension, not, let's not worry about shear for this conversation. Uh, if I just take the area of the bars times 80KSI, I've got a big number, like you know, a lot, of, a lot of capacity there. So let's look at what this means in terms of a breakout calculation, just assuming for the moment that this could actually generate a breakout. Uh, and I'm gonna use a, a mean predictor uh, here for the breakout value with a K of 40 instead of the K of 24 that you see in the code. Uh, and I'm gonna use that uh, roughly 12 inches of embedment and I get for a single bar, I get about 147 kips. If I apply the uh, group factors, just the very basic one of a sub n over a sub n naught. I get a total capacity corresponding to breakout of 263. Now, you can argue, well, that's an underprediction because there's reinforcing in that section that you're showing there, and it's going to help. Uh, maybe, but the point is that that's a big gulf, 569 to 263. And even if you have uh, a lot of additional uh, reinforcing in the wall, um, even using that K of 40, it's unlikely that you're going to make up that gulf. So if, from where I sit, if you have a connection like this and you don't calculate a breakout uh, for its design, you, you've made a big mistake. But I don't believe that the code would tell you that you have to do that. So how did we get here? Uh, we got here because we started out with a concept of development length that originated from the idea that bars need to be terminated at certain junctions past the moment diagram in flexural members. 
uh, and where they terminate has to do with making sure that at the critical section where they are needed, that you have uh, the bars operating at full capacity. So we set this uh, concept up, not we, but the people that generated the concept of develop development length organized this concept of how to set up uh, bar extensions uh, on that basis. Uh, when I was a uh, structural engineer in practice in San Francisco, I don't remember ever making this calculation. Of course, we didn't do a lot of flexural member design, but wherever we needed development length, we used a rule like it's 35D, you know. We did, <laughs> and we basically said, okay, whatever the code would tell us, we're going to be a little more conservative. It doesn't cost a lot to throw extra bar into the, into the, the, uh, into the formwork, and uh, and we didn't get into this in a in a real serious way. But if you look at the way the code has organized itself around this concept of development length, in the meantime, uh, what you see are a lot of statements throughout the code, and I've cited some of them here, uh, where development uh, as a concept is used, and it starts with the definition of development length in the very front end of three eighteen, uh, which unfortunately includes the word develop. So whenever you include the word in the definition of the word that you're trying to define, it's, it's kind of a bad signal that uh, it's a sort of a nebulous concept. Uh, and it gets worse in these other sections where it's referred to uh, as a way to anchor bars. So you, you, but you anchor bars to develop them. Uh, and you see that phraseology used uh, quite frequently. Uh, develop for FY past the opening shall be anchored to develop FY on both sides of the shear plane. So what does it mean to develop FY? Well, for most of us, it always just meant, well, I expect that the bar is going to reach its yield value. And of course, in the seismic world, this is especially important. Um, but are we talking about at a mean strength level? Are we talking about something else? Uh, is it different for seismic detailing? Is the 125% that we typically throw on uh, LCD enough uh, for that? So there are a lot of questions that circulate around this language, but by and large, a lot of engineers read these things and come away with the impression that development length provides them with anchorage, hence my example. Now, in uh, 318.19, we added a section in Chapter 17. So if you never go to Chapter 17, uh, because you just use development length, you'll never see it. But in that new section in Chapter 17, we tell you that if reinforcement is used as anchorage, you need to consider concrete breakout failure, which is a reasonable enough statement. Uh, when, whenever the code tells you to consider something as opposed to you will calculate something, that should be a, a sort of a hint that the code isn't quite sure about this topic. And, uh, and of course, then it right away says, alternatively, you can provide anchor reinforcement. So things like Jack just talked about with candy cane bars uh, in order to avoid this ugly consideration of concrete breakout failure. Why is it so difficult to consider concrete breakout failure for these cases? Well because we have very different safety concepts uh, associated with what's in chapter 17 and what we do in terms of development length. So whether you call it a mean or a median, basically development length equations are predictor for uh, mean strengths. They have an embedded fee factor in them. That fee factor varies uh, depending on whether you get straight hooked or headed bars. And I believe also by bar diameter, uh, you don't see it because it's inside the equation. Uh, but I guarantee you it's nothing like the fee factors that we as associate with anchorage. And of course, all of the fees that we throw at the anchor problem are on top of the 5% fractal uh, resistance. So we take the mean value of resistance and we downgrade it to get the 5% fractal, typically with a multiplier of 0.75 based on the concept of 15% scatter. And we could have a long conversation about where the 15% comes from, but that's not our subject today. In any case, uh, if you just take the ratio of what you would get between chapter 17 and development length on static load cases, it's on the order of 1.5 to 1.8. If you throw in seismic, 
of course, we don't do anything different for development length except for maybe the 125% LD. But if you throw in seismic, these ratios get much larger. And this is where a lot of the problem comes from. The photograph I'm showing you here is a, a result of a prism test that we do when we're qualifying post-installed reinforcing bar systems. And along with the qualification of the post-installed reinforcing bar, we run a parallel test with cast-in-place bars so that we can show that for that concrete and that specimen, you get roughly the same behavior in terms of shear lag. We run these tests at 35D with number eight bars. So it gives us a nice little window into the way number eight bars at minimum edge distance with very little confining steel behave in terms of their development length. And what we find is that those bars reach nominal yield they get to 60 KSI, because that's the kind of bars we are using. Uh, but rarely do they get uh, anywhere near the uh, uh, stress level that you would need to call them yielded, which would be about 75. So fundamentally, that's how we got here. We ended up with a development length concept that was sort of stretched language-wise into applying to a lot of things that it really didn't in originally belong to. And uh, I believe this is a problem for us. Uh, I have pointed out to you that the safety factor concepts are completely different. Uh, we can say apples and oranges. I would, uh, <laughs> had various other phrases to throw in here, but decided against it. In any case, that difference in safety factor concepts is a large part of this. Uh, and one can discuss the merits of 5% fractals or mean values, but ultimately, the code should come to some sort of organized uh, decision about this. So to recap, what do development length equations not do? They don't necessarily always get to, to yield. That was a sort of a big uh, uh, shock to me. And they don't uh, ever give you a hint about the kinds of failures that Amit Varma showed you. Um, and you know, coming last in these presentations is always interesting. You, you start stripping out slides as you see that, uh, oh, that's, <laughs> that's already been covered or shown or whatever. But I'm going to repeat this figure here because it's such a nice photograph of a breakout body uh, with, I believe, 25 number six bars. And of course, what I always like to point out is all that heavy mat reinforcing in the specimen, which is placed there to prevent splitting from occurring in those tests, but does nothing for the breakout capacity. In other words, the mat reinforcing by the time the breakout uh, fracture has progressed uh, to that extent, uh, it, it can't contribute to the uh, ultimate strength of that connection. Okay, I think that's enough of that. I would like to say that we have been exploring, uh, as, as Amit told you, various ways of predicting these kinds of breakout failures for that straight bar case. And the nice thing is, I believe anyway, at this point preliminarily, that just using the equation set that we already have for bonded anchors, we can do a pretty nice job of predicting this behavior uh, in the main. And that's a good sign. If it was completely aberrant to what we do for bonded anchors, it would mean we'd have to go back to the drawing board. And then I think you heard Rolf say at the very outset, more research is needed. Well, yeah, always more research is needed. But in this case, I believe we have uh, enough of, of a handle on the basic behavior relative to those breakout failure modes to, uh, to make some headway here, which is a really good thing. So, uh, that's straight bars, right? But if we think about headed bars and hooked bars, uh, of course, this problem just gets worse. And that's what I tried to show you at the outset uh, with my little calculation. Um, and there are other cases where this can be a problem for us, not just straight uh, breakout, but what about side face blowout? If you used headed bars for a uh, uh, coupling beam uh, using the, the New Zealand detail, uh, and you terminate all those headed bars at one location in the wall, and you haven't checked to see just how much bursting force you're going to generate at those heads, you could uh, get a rude surprise uh, if your structure is actually ever subjected to a design level event. Um, and I just make the very rough calculation here about what uh, the, the uh, side face blowout capacity might be, uh, for a typical case, uh, and again, compare it back to just ASFY, and it's not close. So, you know, well, yeah, but if I put a bunch of confining reinforcing around it, or I put a lot of hoops in there, fine, but at least you need to make the check to see where you're at. And if you're, it's a difference of, like in this case, about 100 kips or more, 120 kips, 
that's a lot of load to try to pick up uh, with uh, with reinforcing uh, that's supposed to amplify your breakout capacity. So I have some slides here to talk about other cases. I'm going to zoom really fast through these. I don't really want to spend a lot of time on this. I'd like to leave more time for people to ask questions in case I've managed to spark some interest in this topic. But of course, we can always look at column anchorage. Right now, we have some language in chapter 16 that talks about precast elements and how they're supposed to be anchored. Uh, it talks about uh, uh, shall be designed to reach their design strength before anchorage failure or failure of surrounding concrete. Well, of course, that's an allusion to this thing that we're talking about. But of course, no reference to the things that are in chapter 17. <laughs> uh, so clearly a great aversion to using chapter 17 for that kind of thing. Um, and I think it leaves the designer at a bit of a quandary. You know, maybe the precast industry can tell them, yeah, do it this way. Uh, this is how we do it. But I think the code should be a little more literal uh, about how this stuff should be done. Uh, as uh, Jack pointed out to you, you know, uh, a lot of the work that he did arose from this fundamental question. If I have a cast in place column and I drop my bars down into the foundation and they're headed bars, I have to calculate L sub DT and I'm done. If I run anchor bolts on a steel column down into the same foundation, I'm in that whole world of, of uh, concrete breakout in, in 17.6. Very different safety concept and a lot more complexity and frankly, a lot more frustration for the steel people. And of course, they've accused us of doing this, uh, you know, because we're concrete people. And, and <laughs> that nothing could be further from the truth from where I sit anyway, but at least that's the way it, it appears. And by the way, even if you add a bunch of stuff in, you know, you say, well, I got all these hoops, I've got, you know, I've got uh, foundation reinforcing, uh, eh, you know, not necessarily, it's not going to get you out of this problem, especially if you resort to calculation methods that really don't relate to the fundamental behavior. And that's the message that we're all trying to get across here. So other cases that I think we should look hard at, Corbel design, a lot of the information we have in the code on Corbel design, uh, relates from stuff that was done a long time ago. There's nothing wrong with stuff that was done a long time ago, uh, but uh, we have a lot better handle now on the way concrete fractures, uh, what precipitates those fractures. And I think some of the language that we use for the design of these types of things is not as helpful as it might be. Let's put it that way. Uh, so there are corbels. Uh, and there's all this business about, uh, well, you know, U-shaped bars in a horizontal plane provide effective end hooks. Well, what do we mean by effective end hooks? Uh, so I think those are things where we can put a better focus on how this stuff behaves, uh, whether we want to advocate for strut and tie models or for something else, but use language that's consistent relative to the types of failures that we expect to get. Jack has already gone through the beam column joint business and this business of the uh, depth of the beam uh, uh, and, and whether or not you get to count that compression force for augmenting the breakout body. But the whole point is, this is really, a, in many cases, an issue of breakout behavior. Um, and, but we treat it as a development length problem. We have traditionally, that's the way people like to do it. But in fact, uh, you know, what we see in, uh, in the tests that have been done is that you get things that look like breakout. Uh, although there seems to be a lot of controversy about that. And this is the last area, and I know this is a scary one, but if you think about pre-stressing and the language that we have in the code for how you do uh, the anchorage of the uh, post-tensioning uh, systems, most of that stuff is in the commentary, and most of it deals with uh, you know, bursting forces that are generated at those anchorages. And in fact, those bursting forces have an awful lot to do with the other forces that we deal with on the anchor side. It's just, of course, the pre-stressed industry has developed a whole different universe of approaches to how to make this stuff work for them. I'm, obviously, they're successful. Otherwise, every time they try to post-tension a beam, it would explode, right? But the question is, does the code treat this stuff consistently uh, in terms of the, the failure methodologies or the failure modes that we expect to occur when you don't do this stuff right. And I only throw this slide in here because ages and ages ago, I learned about these kinds of transfer stresses that you get uh, at the University of Stuttgart because this was stuff that Leonhardt had uh, proposed. Um, so, you know, I think there are quite a few 
uh, areas of overlap where we could bring this language together and perhaps give engineers a more consistent picture. So once again, uh, just to reinforce the point, this time with uh, grade 60 bars and uh, even more of them welded to a little plate, you know, if I run the calculations, I get nothing close to the capacity of all those bars at yield. And, uh, and, and I believe this is something we really have to take on. Uh, I can do the same thing with hooked bars. And as we know now from the testing of a meat, because we didn't know that before he got started, you can even do the same thing with straight bars. And by the way, he's using straight bars uh, for most of those tests uh, that don't have uh, the same bond strength uh, as standard lug bars. These were deformed wire anchors, which is what I think of as just dimpled wire. And so you would think, oh, you know, not as much bond strength. No, it's never going to happen. Indeed, uh, if you stick enough force locally in the concrete, you will get the same failure mode. So what do we do about this? I think we need a more consistent approach to determining controlling failure modes. We need to talk about all the potential failure modes. And we need to do so in a location of the code where the engineer doesn't have to run around from section to section to find them. I think we really need a consistent approach to establishing the required probability of failure. That's another way of saying we need to get our act together about these fee factors and about the use of mean strength versus 5% fractal. Uh, that's just a necessity. And I believe it probably means that both sides need to come a little toward the middle uh, to get to a place where we agree. I think we have all the necessary tools. That's the only good news I can give you. I think we have the necessary analytical tools to solve this problem. Uh, we just have to put our heads together and uh, have the will to try to make the necessary corrections. Now, what I'm going to show you here right at the end, uh, with about five minutes remaining, is not been vetted by anybody but me, uh, but it is my take on how we might approach the safety factor problem. Right now, we have a table 2121, which is strength reduction factors for the code. And in there, you see under item J, uh, all of the fee factors for anchorage 0.45 to 0.75 in accordance with chapter 17. So you go to chapter 17 and you find these other three tables with all the complicated little fee factors for all the different failure modes and anchor types, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think this drives a lot of people kind of nuts. Uh, so in view of that, one way to, to think about the problem might be to say, let's just establish a range of strength reduction factors that are appropriate for anchorage. And of course, the point 0.65 and 5.5 and 4.5 that are appropriate for post-installed anchors, maybe we don't need to include that in a fee factor. Maybe we do that in a different way. So if I just handle the normal stuff, maybe I get a range in fees from 0.65 to 0.85, and I assign those fee factors associated to the things that matter to me in terms of performance, like risk level, redundancy, sustained loads or not, uh, and, and seismic and transient, right? So that's one possible way to break this scheme down. And I did it with colors just because if you throw a bunch of numbers into a table like this, it starts to look kind of meaningless, but the colors kind of help you make sure that you're going in the right direction. And out of that type of a philosophy, you could possibly generate, lo and behold, a single table for strength reduction factors for the code that would cover everything. And, uh, and if we could do that, I think it would make a huge difference to the way people treat this problem uh, using the document. I haven't talked about how to deal with the 5% fractal in here. That's a whole separate conversation about whether you believe that uh, the variability in concrete tensile strength needs to be explicitly considered that way or needs to be taken in the, in the fee factor. Uh, but ultimately, we need to get it straight so that the design community is not left scratching their heads trying to figure out what it was that the code intended. Okay, last, last picture from me, the code is inconsistent. It could lead to gross errors in design. Some people may disagree, but I firmly believe that it could. Uh, and the references to Anchorage and 318 need to be studied. Uh, we need to coordinate our language. We need to figure out the safety factors. And I am thinking it might make sense for us to sort of consolidate all of this stuff in one section. But I know there's been a lot of work done to reorganize the code in a way that makes, at least makes professors happy. <laughs> and maybe we don't have the option to, uh, 
to do that anymore. But for me, as I said, having all of this stuff in one location would make uh, a heck of a lot of horse sense uh, for the design profession.